Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. He had Vietnam onto this and Watergate, and then he's got the sentence, being committed to the nation no longer gave people hope. Today on Reflections, Father Basic talks with Dr. Thomas Dunn, who is a professor of educational psychology at the University of Toledo. Today, Father Basic and Dr. Dunn will discuss depression and collapsing institutions. And now, here is Father Basic. Tom, I'd like to talk a little bit about the topic of depression. That's uh, something that all of us have to deal with in one way or another. I suppose no one escapes those symptoms to some degree of feeling helpless and passive and inactive and the blahs take over and maybe it's hard to get out of bed in the morning. Um, when that goes on for a while, it's, it's pretty common for us to say we're depressed, mm -hmm. we feel fatigued, everything wears us out, we don't have enough energy to do what we want. I suppose then it gets to the point of, of that I, I don't want to get involved in things or I'm sort of afraid to go outside and that in a, its boundary situation, of course, we get to the question of suicide where mm -hmm. it doesn't make any difference anymore. Why should I keep going? But uh, while people maybe they don't always get to the question of suicide, almost everyone knows what depression right. is to some degree, If you de at least if you describe it properly. It's a technical term, but uh, I guess one of the distinctions I see in the literature is between manic depression and episodic depression, so that manic depression seems to be where people go way up and have these exalted feelings and uh, mm -hmm. highs and everything's great and then plunge down to the depths and everything is all. And I think a lot of people feel that that really is physiologically based in one way or another. But then we got these episodic depressions where it seems it results from uh, external events or especially our perspective on external right. events. That's right. Uh, there's an article you pointed out to me that I found to be very helpful along this line. That's by Martin Seligman. It was in Psychology Today. I don't really remember exactly when, but uh, what the, it's October 1988, Psychology Today. Um, and what's the title of it? Boomer, Boomer Blues. Blues. <laughs> Boomer Blues. <laughs> uh, why did he Terrific call it title. Boomer Blues? Well, because of the results of data that he discusses, research data, that baby boomer, the baby boomer generation. What does that mean, baby boomers? Well, I think it's uh, people who were born right after World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was an upturn in the population yes. when everything settled down and soldiers came home. Uh, that that uh, population has a dr dramatic increase in depression. Much more so than their parents or their grandparents. Ac absolutely. In fact, uh, Solomon claims ten times as ten much, times as much right. a depression you're going to find in young people as old people. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, too. He, c he does a comparison with other cultures along this line. And, and uh, he looks at some classical primitive cultures, and while you can find manic depression there, you, you don't, uh, maybe 1 or 2% of the population, you don't find episodic depression. It, it just doesn't exist. They found these various tribes in New Guinea. They t talks about the Kaluli tribe, if that's how you pronounce it. And, and they have an interesting way. They don't get depressed because the society helps them overcome it. It says if, if a person in that tribe lost something valuable, like a pig, he says, well, then the society takes care of that. Uh, through dancing and screaming at the neighbor who presumably killed the pig. And then when someone wants recompense for this, then the whole tribe sort of comes to their aid and makes right. sure that they haven't really suffered any loss, that it's taken care of. So, so therefore, the tribesman, I guess, does not feel depressed because he, he's found a way to manage this. And, this. and his culture, his society, his tribe helps him to, to have power to deal with things. And it gives him some way to turn. Uh, there's there's something out there that uh, creates a, a, a system or a way of dealing with these, so he doesn't have to rely totally on inner resources. Yeah, that, that's well put. Yeah, that's the, there's something besides just yourself involved. Right. And I think Seligman feels that a lot of the depression comes from rising expectations about reliance upon oneself and, and, and not being able to count on the culture in which we live. He, but he points out we don't really have to go back to this primitive tribe in New Guinea, but there's been a study for the last 20 years of the Amish community in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, 10,000 Amish living in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and a, a mid-19th century farming culture, as he calls, no electricity, no automobiles, no alcohol, no drugs. And when they study those people, they find out there's almost no depression. And uh, you, you know, you'd look at that and say, no geez, they don't even have all these conveniences we have. Life must be tough for them, but they're not depressed. 
it's it's quite remarkable so uh, this begins to suggest that we look at why we're depressed mm-hmm. right and, and what the causes are I see that he talks really about uh, four different causes he talks about the sort of personalized mass production by that I guess he means that we can buy almost anything we want these days any color any size yeah <laughs> right made to order yeah why does that cause depression, though? Well, it, in itself it doesn't cause depression, but it's a manifestation of uh, the power of the individual. In other words, now we wouldn't be pleased with a black Ford. <laughs> We'd have to have it. We would only be pleased... A if red it, Pontiac or something. Well, no, if it red with black and red stripes and uh, all individualized. Uh-huh. See, so in other words, if we, if they made only one kind of car, how could you be depressed if you got that color? I see. But now that there are one million alternatives, if you can't cut the very one you want, then you're depressed. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So we've got all these options, sure. yeah. and if you can't get the right one... Then you feel bad. Yeah. Right. Okay, here's the second one. Let's say the second one, he says, is that there's general prosperity. He, says, he talks about having an exalted sense of the self. With a general affluence. And I guess that just feeds into what you were saying, right? That and of course, there's an irony on that. If you ask people how prosperous they feel, they don't. But there's so much more discretionary money around now, meaning we spend so much more money other than just a roof over our heads and food on the table. So that even teenagers, for example, have enormous amounts of discretionary money. So they, they need the best clothes. They need a car. Uh, and years ago... You didn't have that. What about this? Some people get depressed even though they get a car. So, I mean, you got a 17-year-old who has a car, plays on the football team, gets good grades, has mm-hmm. a lot of friends, and commits suicide. Sure. Yeah, everything that looks pretty good for that individual. Yeah. And, of course, we can't be too general here in saying what a... But there's lots of opportunities for that person to feel disappointed in all the events and all the particular situations that occur... It may not be that he has the type of car he wants. Uh, he he may be second string instead of first string on the football team. Mm-hmm. He may not uh, be so, able to cut it in school mm-hmm. because he may not have the discipline to do so. So we're, we're dealing here with that question of rising expectations right. here, that there's these high expectations and that no matter what you get, there's always more expectation and you can never completely fulfill it. It's always uh, beyond our grasp in some sense. That's right. Yes. Now, Tom, he says he goes on here, and then he, he gives what I would call more sociological reasons why depression has increased tenfold among young people these days. And he, he talks about the assassination of public leaders, for one. He talks about, and, and I, I, can, I can see this, too. He talks about November 22, 1963, as being a watershed date. That's the assassination of President Kennedy, mm-hmm. when Camelot died for many of us. 25 years. Yeah, and when it was all there, and, and there was this great hope we had with a young president, and the world was going to be better, and we were going to have a sense of public service. What are we going to do for our mm-hmm. country? And we would bear any burden. To, to make sure the peace in the world and so on and there was a you know there was an upbeat spirit at least that's my remembrance of it and uh, here the president gets shot down like that you know I've talked to young people that tell me that when they look at uh, I'm trying to think of the age of this person who told me early 30s I suppose now but when they watch television after all the assassinations we've had Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy mm-hmm. and so on even President Reagan being shot and the Pope being shot right. That when they watch te- public figures on television, they're always sort of vaguely afraid that that's going to happen. It's burnt into their psyche that when mm-hmm. public figures are out there, they might well get shot. Now, I, I, I think what Seligman says, and Seligman is an expert on depression, right? Yes. I mean, yes, we're dealing yes. with a reputable author here. Yes. Of many been years. For 20, 25 years. Yeah. He, he goes on and, and he says that what happened at this, um, that. You add Vietnam onto this and Watergate, and then he's got this sentence, being committed to the nation no longer gave people hope. Yes, and I don't think people realize what a dramatic difference that is. And I, and I always try to reflect, because I was in that generation which started to have less trust, being against the war in Vietnam. And But as as a young child, I remember growing up that that you did have faith in your country, that you thought we were good, and... And because uh, there, there's a problem there, but the advantage is that that does give you hope. Mm-hmm. That and that, stability, and right? stability, yes, it does. Yeah. And then after Vietnam and, and the kinds of uh, problems you're talking about, 
I always wonder what's in the minds of kids growing up now. Do they look to the future? You know, when we were growing up, we looked to the future that things are always going to be better than they were now. Yeah. And parents prepared their children to be better than they were. You're going to earn more money, you're going to get higher education, yep. and everything was linear, it was going up. Well, it isn't that way now, and we've had actually probably 10, 15, 20 years when it hasn't been that way. You know, I, I remember getting this from uh, students in my class, and I don't have data on this, but if you ask them something about if they thought the economy was going to get better or society was going to mm -hmm. get straightened out, or uh, they, their answers were no. Mm -hmm. They generally were... Uh, uh, had a negative outlook on that. It's not going to get better, but their own personal life was going to get better. And that they that would make very more money. The they would make more money. They would get a good job. They would live in the suburbs and have the good life. But society as a whole would get worse. Well, there's an irony there. Did anyone ever ask you when you were in school? Do you think life's going to get better? Do you I don't think? remember that. No, the people didn't <laughs> ask those questions then. <laughs> they weren't. That's right. You weren't programmed to think in that way. You knew it was going to get better. Uh huh. You felt it was. There was an assumption. An assumption. It, things were going to get better, and I guess. And is that why people that age didn't get as depressed as as people do today? Well, it it gave you a direction and gave you something to shoot for, and uh, actually, it also uh, gave you a rationale for working hard. And then, when the economy started to falter, when job success was no longer uh, t correlated with how well you did in school. We didn't have as many good reasons for kids to do well in school, and they didn't really know what direction they wanted to go in. There were no clear roles existing. There was distrust in the government, and also a, uh, uh, if not a distrust in God, a sort of going away from God as an active force, mm -hmm. and so all more reliance on self. Yeah, okay, and that's, that's what Seligman sees as the combination, isn't it? That when you get a breakdown in the institutions, collapse of institutional life, and you get rising expectations, mm -hmm. then you are going to have more depression. A bad combination, isn't yes. it? Yes, <laughs> a bad combination. You, you brought up there the, the, the whole notion of uh, church and religion and faith, because he brings that into the picture as well. He, he, he wants to talk to us uh, not only about the assassinations here of the public leaders, but of the whole business of the, the breakdown of, of family life mm -hmm. and the breakdown of uh, the institutions we relied on. And I would include the church in that. And also even the breakdown of faith itself. Mm -hmm. And I think his sense is that uh, it's like that tribe, that tribe in New Guinea. They had rituals and symbols right. which helped them to deal with the loss of the pig. Uh, in our culture today, when someone has high expectations that they're going to get a better job and aren't able to achieve it, or when they're going to be a, a movie star and can't make that, or they're not going to find the right partner for marriage, then there aren't any rituals, there aren't any societal props that really help them to do that, to, to get through it, to manage right. it. And I think it, we might think of the church along this line and the way religion functions. You know, you can do a psychological analysis of religion where you say, well, as Freud did, well, it's a projection. We have a need for a father figure, so we say a father figure exists, but that's really an illusion. Mm -hmm. Or we can talk about religion satisfying us psychologically, and it gives us a sense of meaning and purpose. But religion also has a sociological function. It's like the glue that holds the society together. It's a symbol system that helps to root us. It's a, uh, what, what the sociologists call an interpretive scheme that allows us to know who we are and where we right. fit. That's how religion ought to work. And, and, and it ought to be in our bones and blood and, and create a sense of community and help us to belong and bring us together with people who share our values. In our Judeo-Christian tradition, it, it gives us the scriptures which uh, holds us together. Mm -hmm. You know, as I'm saying this, time, I just flashed on the Christian-Muslim dialogue I've done in the past and the way for Muslim students, religion still works that way. They are passionate about religion. They don't understand, for example, the separation of church and state. Right. They, they don't understand people being half-hearted about religion. They're passionate about it because religion is a whole way of life for them. That's what seems to have broken down for us. It's not that people don't go to church. We got a high. We got people, more, probably more people going to church now than we've had before, and high rates of belief in God. But you don't have the sociological props connected with it. The uh, solidity pervasive structure. Yeah. That's how I think right. religion should work, and that's what I think our friend Seligman here is saying has right. broken down. Sure. And causes the depression. And of course, then it creates more, uh, creates more of a reliance on the self, and we're just not prepared to deal with 
life events that way. Do you think that's just natural that that, uh, that maybe we could get prepared? Like Nietzsche said, we could get rid of all those props and God would die and the, the Superman would come forward and be able to create his own values and, and live out his destiny and so on. And, you know, and the question would be, I guess, can only a few people do that, if anyone? Or is it unrealistic to, to think that pe- we're going to train people or enable people to take hold of their lives like that? Well, I think we see evidence that only a few people can do that. And that's why uh, we have so many teenagers going towards more of the kind of cult-type religions, which, which actually meets those needs. Uh, yes, we may have some people who have a, a well-formed um, uh, uh, ego, or even uh, higher levels of indeterminated or indeterminate morality, so that they can withstand the real world problems. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're going to find a small percentage. Small like percentage that. of people can do that. I like the way you said that that, uh, that sort of inner directedness there, and, and finding their moral strength within. Or, mm-hmm. or I, I think that is a lot of the way Nietzsche saw it, or the way he thought that people would. I also was thinking about when Nietzsche did his description. He also talked about in the new world, the earth being unchained from the sun and people not knowing up from down. In other words, it's almost as though he prophetically saw the uh, the chaos that would result when the absolutes of the institutions, the church, and the government would collapse on us. Mm -hmm. That's not to say the government isn't working, but it it doesn't work psychologically in the same way. It doesn't do the same thing for people. That is, give them a sense of hope and purpose and higher mission and so on. Well, practically, we might... Uh, mankind might evolve to a point in time where they can be more interdirected. They can, as individuals, decide what they want to do and when they want to do it, and at the same time, that doesn't conflict with others' needs and rights. But it sure doesn't seem to, way th- seem to be the way things are now. Do you, do you think, when you think of students that you teach now and so on, do you see this uh, collapse of the absolutes and these institutional problems. I mean, they don't talk in those terms. They talk almost entirely in terms of personal, psychological needs. But I, mm-hmm. in other words, I think maybe all this is working more indirectly or subtly on them. Very subtle. It's. It's. Uh, um, I think uh, most of the time, you people. It's pretty obvious. People need something to strive for, uh, a structure. Uh, that provides them meaningful, realistic goals. Uh, and if left to their own resources, some can do it, some can't. Uh, and l- leaving to their own resources is a scary proposition. It sounds mm-hmm. great because we want freedom. Yeah. And it's hard to use those terms because if we say that, uh, that what we really have is too much freedom, then obviously people are going to object to that. But uh, what we're talking about is, is, is a world where we don't have to make as many choices all the time, and that some are made for us because we're not capable of making them all. I know Seligman, I'm not sure he does it in this article, but he talks about that distinction between a learned helplessness and a learned resourcefulness. Yes. I think, I think we could apply that to this whole institutional analysis as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe what, what we've gotten to the point where people are just saying, well, I, I've learned out of my experience you can't trust institutions. You know, none of them are really, uh, really can are worthy of trust. The, right. the government, v- Watergate, Vietnam. You can't trust politicians. Can't trust church people. You know, the churches are out for their own selves or to make money or whatever. Well, if a person believes that, yeah, what's the logical consequence of a belief? I'm back on myself and unhappiness. No. I mean, because how can they live in a world where they can, where they don't have to deal with systems? They're out there. If you distrust the systems, if you distrust no. your lawyer, your doctor... You become more helpless then. Absolutely. Yeah, let, let's make sure we got the dynamics straight on this, Tom. The way you, so you start out and you think that you know life's supposed to produce certain things for you. You have high expectations of how life is supposed mm-hmm. to go. Then you find out, you run up into situations where you can't actualize those expectations. Then you begin to feel helpless, and I'm a victim. Right. Then I fall into depression, right? Yes. That's sort of the sequence? Well, uh, yes, and the key is that when your expectations are not met, and if that happens enough, then you start to view this as a stable phenomenon that's going to be forevermore, and that it's going to mm-hmm. affect everything in your life, and that it's something internal, something about you. 
So that's probably the young people saying, well, I don't want to get involved in politics. I'm not interested in the election. It doesn't make any difference mm -hmm. who you elect. One guy's as bad as another. My vote doesn't matter. The government's corrupt anyway. So if you if you adopt that posture, you can hardly think of social change, can you? That's right. It almost makes you think that uh, a, that depression and cynicism go very closely together mm. because you you often see the depressed person being very cynical. Oh yeah. You know, and so almost, psychologically, we would probably put it link it with fatigue, and sociologically, mm -hmm. as we're talking about it here, we would link it with cynicism. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's, it's that's kind of sad to insight. see that that combination. Yeah. Tom, what are we what are we going to do about this? You know, I mean, how are we going to overcome this? Of course, from my perspective as a theologian, it, it seems to me that that faith in God and the role of the church would really be crucial. Mm -hmm. I mean, faith in God is supposed to give us an overall sense of things. If you if you're a Christian and believe in the resurrection of Christ, you believe that it's possible to rise up from the evil, that that, that there's light in the midst of the darkness, mm -hmm. that that even the most terrible troubles of life uh, somehow can lead to a richer and better life. So that's the, the essence of that Christian death and resurrection notion, that God is in charge of the world and brings good even out of the evil. Yes. He raises the man Jesus to life. That is sort of a life-giving notion. That, that's a notion that gives hope, I think, in the midst of depression. That would seem a big part of a cure to me, is, mm -hmm. is to have faith. Yes. Well, I think you said it. Uh, faith is the opposite of depression when you look at it that way. Mm -hmm. A depression is nothing's going to work, I'm bad, everything's going to be uh, miserable for the rest of my life. No. Faith is the opposite of that. Uh, on an individual basis, you know, we have therapies that work on, even if they don't use the term faith, they are working on the individual finding finding out that, yes, I am good, yes, there mm -hmm. are good things in the world, and, we, and they literally have to practice it. Uh, that's on an individual basis, but uh, the sense of Seligman, Seligman, I can't pronounce that <laughs> yeah, word. That's all right, Seligman. Uh, Seligman, <laughs> yeah. right. His article is one which, which looks at a more global issue. Yeah. And uh, and I think he hopes it's kind of an act of faith he's making that in an evolutionary sense, we will turn away from <laughs> an emphasis on self back to uh, belief in systems and God and... and, and uh, yeah, he thinks that individualism has the seeds of its own destruction yes, in it, that yes. it, it reaches limit points and mm -hmm. where it no longer works and therefore people will be thrown back on, on an older belief yeah. system, I suppose. Well, in a, a survival of the fittest, it's yeah. not fit enough. It's not... I wonder, I, I'd like to propose maybe a more um, radical solution... Uh, or more liberal solution, instead of thinking of sort of going back to the old-time religion, and I'm not saying that's exactly what he's proposing, but some have proposed it mm -hmm, if he right. hasn't. But I'd like to, maybe part of our future lies in what we call these small faith communities, the base communities in Latin America. They're, they're the groups, the, the people who get together uh, around shared values, around their Christian faith, and they, they, they're small enough so they know one another, they know when one, the other person's mother is sick or when they lost a job, and that they're there to try to help the person deal with it and to be a direct source of mm -hmm. comfort, not a philanthropic hand far off giving out money, but some flesh and blood individual who's there to hold you when the chaos is threatening. And, and, and where people can uh, pray together and uh, do social justice work together and maybe find in there some of this rootedness and uh, community life that uh, Seligman found in, in the, in the tr ancient tribes and in the Amish people in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yes, it sounds good. It, it might, uh, it might uh, be successful in getting the depressed person to think outside himself or herself because that's the other aspect of the depressed person is an overwhelming reflection on the self, mm -hmm. very egocentric. So we want to lift people out of that, and maybe yes. if they've got to stand shoulder to shoulder with someone else working on peace or racial right. questions yeah. or feeding hungry people, that that's going to help them out. I, th I think that's sort of a common sense way out of depression anyway, isn't it? If someone's really depressed, maybe they should sit down and write a note to their mother, a collegian, you know, and, yes. and saying thank you for what you've done for me or uh, go out and help some other person. I, that's been in common in the spiritual literature for years. Well, it's also common in the therapeutic literature, mm -hmm. at least recently, that, that doing something and doing something for others turns out to be a very good step to get yourself out of depression. So you become a better part of the group, the community then. You feel like you've made a constructive mm -hmm. contribution to it, and, and you begin to feel better about yourself. So one of the keys you keep stressing, Tom, is you've got to get off self-centeredness, right? Right. 
because that will just drag you down. And, and the more you worry, dwelling on the yeah, self and yeah, how bad things I feel are. bad, and then right. for I'll feel worse. Maybe it even goes with anger. I'm angry, so that's terrible, and I'm going to get angrier about it, and it just sort of snowballs. Mm -hmm. And what your suggestion is we got to break out of that, get ourselves involved in a larger world, in the community as a whole, and then thus break the chain of depression. Yes. Yes, very much so. Mm -hmm. Well, we're uh, trying to talk here about a topic I think that's really important to everyone. I mean, we all feel depressed at times. And, and our friend uh, Seligman, who's written the article in Psychology Today, is telling us there's a lot of causes of that. One of the causes, of course, is rising expectations that we want too much, and when we don't get it, we feel unhappy. But the other side of it is more societal. That is that the institutions that we've relied on have collapsed in one way or another. So people lack faith in the government. People drift away from the church, or the church doesn't function as really an interpretive scheme for them or a really solidifying mm -hmm. symbol system, and therefore people feel adrift. But if we're going to get something going in a positive direction, we need involvement. We need to care about the common good. We need to be active participants in various communities, and then that will get us out of ourselves. And in the midst of all of that, this larger faith perspective I propose ought to help us. That is, that there's a God who's with us as we struggle with those kind of problems. You've been listening to Reflections with theologian Father James Basic, lecturer and campus minister at the University of Toledo. Today, Father Basic talked with Dr. Thomas Dunn, who is a professor of educational psychology at the University of Toledo. The topic of this week's Reflections was depression and collapsing institutions. If you have any comments on today's show or suggestions for future programs, please write Father James Basic. Catholic Campus Ministry, 2086 Brookdale Drive, Toledo, Ohio, 43606. Funding for this program was provided by the Catholic Communications Commission of the Diocese of Toledo.